Prima Media's policy, I'm Sash Nimadi. Joining me today is News24 journalist Jeff Wick, unpacking his co-authored book, Eight Days in July, Inside the Zuma Unrest That Sets South Africa Alliance. Your co-authored book, Eight Days in July, details the unrest and looting that engulfed the country after former President Jacob Zuma was imprisoned. And I think many people assume this began because Zuma was imprisoned. And while it was a catalyst for that, your book tells of another more orchestrated plan that was specifically aimed at economic sabotage and racial division. So I think the questions that everybody wants answers to are who would want this for the country and what exactly was their plan according to your research? Well, I mean, in writing this book, we managed to get our hands on a trove of intelligence information, which told us a number of things. Firstly, that this insurrection or plans to destabilize the country were um, ferried up to the highest um, echelons of government several months before it actually happened. And then thereafter, um, it seemed to be linked directly to the the imprisonment of Jacob Zuma in that as you correctly said, it became the catalyst for this insurrection. And we looked at factors which included the RET camp, which is closely aligned to, to Jacob Zuma's uh, wounded coalition and his cause, as well as the MKMBA and a number of other enterprises which are criminal in nature. And I don't say that lightly. I'm, I'm speaking about obviously trucking mafias and other nefarious actors who then preyed upon the existing societal divisions and the existing societal ills of poverty and inequality and galvanized themselves together and were very successful in bringing two provinces to their knees. Just speak a bit about what it was like for journalists on the ground during those eight days. In the book, I mean, you detail some pretty horrific things that you saw. And you also talk about what it was like for you walking down Jewel Street in Joburg, you know, during these fueled racial tensions. I think there's a number of things to consider when answering that question. And, you know, as, as journalists, it was very difficult for us as, as a start. Our status quo was completely upended just as much as it was for everyone else in the country. But we saw things like our resources being stretched beyond measure, just as, as the police and the security forces and the private security industry were um, running helter skelter, so were we. I think some of the the, the pitfalls of of the press and you know the, the hollowing out of or the the shrinking of newsrooms over the past couple of years was really highlighted in that point because we found ourselves in a situation which really closely resembled the civil war. I mean, the the constitutional order was imperiled. Lawlessness was pervasive, especially in Brazilian itself. There was things like freedom of movement were completely done away with because the roads were closed. We found ourselves in a situation where there were food and fuel shortages. And I think for the first time in our democratic order, we had things like food rationing taking place over large parts of Brazil and Natal. So the situation was really dire. And for journalists, it was very difficult because you needed to sort of split yourself into several different parts to cover everything. And I think that was one of the criticisms of the media that was um, sort of highlighted at the time was that, you know, we were paying attention to only certain areas. And that's because there simply were not enough of us to get around. Speaking of the, the, the aspects of personal safety and danger, you know, we speak about it in the book uh, about the incident in Hillbrow where a TV crew was, was set upon by a mob of people and they actually shot up their car. And um, so it's, it's clear cut for me to say that journalists were, of course, in, in the firing line. And you, you, you raised the point of my own little experience with, with racism on that day where I was on Jewel Street and we were following police as they engaged with looters who had been running rampant since the morning. A group of men were obviously jeering us and all of a sudden it, it was made about my race as a journalist when a man told me that he hoped I died today. And further than that, into that issue, I didn't delve simply because of the hostility that was created. And, and I, I think that's a sense that most journalists got of that time was that there was something about this protest action that was clearly different. There was a level of hostility which we'd not seen before, not only towards us, but towards the police. I have a colleague in, in Durban who works for, for ENCA, Desen Fathia. I mean, he was on, on, on the ground for a lot of the skirmishes as well, and, and he was shot at. And there's video footage of, of bullets whizzing over his head. Um, so, you know, it, it was it was a, a testing time for the media. And, and I think I actually must applaud the media on the whole's resilience and their... Um, the nimble way in which they were able to adapt and approach it. I mean, looking at things like all of a sudden we have to get all our staff's body on in bulletproof vests and we need to assure their safety because we perform a vital function of telling people what is happening on the ground in the country as it was unfolding. And, um, you know, personally, I didn't, I, I didn't sleep for a lot of that time because there was simply so much going on. 
Now, the book also reveals that the security cluster did have early warnings at least two months before the unrest and that officials, government officials, knew of the warnings. So why were security forces so ill-prepared when the riots began and government so slow to respond? I mean, your book talks about budget cuts and even the effects of Marikana as factors. What happened in the way the, the, the police specifically, if, 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 if we're going to touch on that, um, were hamstrung in their approach. There's, there's a number of factors that, that lead into it. Budget cuts, I think, is, is the most legacy issue and the one that affected the police, not, not so much overtly, but in retrospect, as we examine how the police response was hemmed in by these protesters, the budget constraints are a real issue. You have a capacity shortage because you have good officers leaving the police force. And then you've got a, a budget which is consistently shrinking, exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So, so then we are already short of manpower on the ground. Another aspect when you consider the police response is just the way the police are structured in terms of how they deal with protest action. So our public order policing units are, are centralized, whereas in the past, at a station level, there was a capacity to deal with public protests. Now these units have become centralized and they've become smaller. So in terms of responding to these incidents, they need to move from a central mode. And when you have several road closures happening simultaneously, this response is, is stretched and that's right at the outset. That's before the matter reaches critical mass or, or, or gets out of control. And there was a clear modus operandi by those who were trying to seed this violence or seed looting. And we saw it, and you know, our, our reporter and co-author Kriveel Singh, he saw it with his own eyes from a helicopter as he circled above Durban where buckies would come in and lay tires across the road, set fire to them and leave. And those road closures all hampered the police. Another factor that, that can't be ignored is the factional divide that besets our police force at, at the moment. It's played out in the public domain. We've written extensively about it for the last year. And that's the bitter discord between Bech Trele and National Police Commissioner Ketla Sutole. They clash on key appointments. There's clearly camps within the police. And, you, you, you know, leadership becomes a really important factor when you need to present a united front and you need to take on an insurrection, call it what it is, that is ordered and clearly planned. And this cannot be seen as um, sort of a popular uprising by the poor. I think the poor were weaponized to a certain extent by influencers and agitators in, that, in their specific communities to go out and to cause destruction. But looting is one thing, and looting represents a poverty issue. But what we saw in those eight days in July was far beyond looting. A looter has no business in forcing their way into a store and then setting it on fire. And, and that is one of the major differences we picked up just in strategies. It wasn't an only a campaign to prompt looting, to prompt destruction, but then to really look at vandalism to inflict maximum economic damage. And that was seen all across the country. I mean, it was seen in malls in Pretoria and in Johannesburg, and in particularly in Kuzulu Natal. You know, a, a perfect case study of that is the macro in Springfield Park and the, the Springfield Value Center. There's hundreds of millions of rands worth of stock that were um, stacked in those warehouses. All of them were stripped bare. And then the buildings were gutted by fire. And you know, that it, it, it holds no logic that your run-of-the-mill looter who is just desperately in the clutches of pro poverty and trying to take what they can would then set fire to these things. So we have to consider that, that there were hidden hands involved. And I think by this point, it's clear but um, whether or not those hidden hands will ever be brought to book, you know, we, we, we haven't seen a lot of traction in, in the prosecution. We've seen the arrest of only a handful of individuals who, who by our estimation, are low-level agitators and, and the architects of this bedlam um, that was so damaging to this country in a time of great strife are still at large. You mentioned the oh. RET earlier, um, the Radical Economic Transformation Faction of the ANC. How did it come about? And tell us about its role as Zuma's so-called army, especially during the unrest. Well, the, the RET faction within the ANC is quite interesting. You know, they, they represent an emboldened part of the governing party who are completely at odds with its leadership and have been for a very long time. They've coalesced with Zuma and they've, they've become his cheerleading squad. And we've seen the likes of Carl Niehaus do that and be arrested for it. And they're important because in the lead up to his imprisonment, which was obviously the tipping point in what we saw, they had pledged to destabilize the country. There would always be a counterpunch from the RET faction. And that's exactly what we saw. 
And it also becomes diff- difficult for the ruling party because now they, they are forced to have an element of introspection. And they have to say, this is an issue that started from within us and it, which spilled onto the streets. The RET faction represents sort of a coalition of the wounded and they form quite a, a, a militant opposition to the reformists in the current um, executive, the public at large, especially during that period with victims of that. And it was actually shocking to read that at least 26 ANC members and government employees were part of WhatsApp groups that were used to mobilize these mass protests. I mean, these are people in President Cyril Ramaphosa's government that were actively working against him. Yes, I mean, like I said, um, it, it, it was a faction fight within the ANC that spilled onto the streets. And I mean, you make a valid point, especially in a very contentious area where there was a lot of violence and there was tragic racial profiling, which was saw an immense loss of life. And in that specific area, we had actors within the ANC, people who take government salaries home, calling for the closure of roads, calling for a complete economic shutdown. And it's not only in those areas that they called for it, there were plans afoot to close down the harbour, the busiest harbour in Africa. And it borders on uh, sedition, really, because they were trying to shut down key economic lifelines to the province for nefarious ends, all because of factional politics and really because of the imprisonment of one man. The ANC needs to examine itself and they need to understand how their faction fights and their struggles for power within the ranks um, affect the general populace. And the role of vigilantes was a distressing event, you know, born out of the unrest. I mean, people were racially profiling people at roadblocks um, and this also bolstered right-wing groups. Can you just talk to us about those aspects? The issue of vigilantes is, is something of a quagmire when those eight days were playing out and it became clear early on that law enforcement was stretched and so too was private security, simply from a capacity issue. You know, when, when these things flare up all over the country um, and in vastly different areas at the same time, capacities were stretched early on. So it necessitates people coming together and taking a stand. And I think that had people not grouped together and not um, stood up to the looters or whoever was trying to make their way into the areas, um, things would have gotten a lot worse. And a lot of infrastructure was saved because of vigilantes. And it's difficult for me to call them that because it's not a blanket term. But in doing that, the specter of racism reared early on and it reared all over the place, you know, and it, it, it really went a ways towards shattering the facade of our rainbow nation because it was really dispiriting to see how quickly we regressed to racial profiling. I mean, there were incidents in upmarket areas like in Schlunga where black residents who've lived there and lived there for years were called to uh, produce proof of residence and question on what they were doing and why they were doing it. And, you know, it, it, it harkens back to our country's very dark history. And I think sort of the apex of the tragedy of that racial profiling played out in Phoenix, uh, where where racial divides were capitalized upon deliberately um, by, um, again, unseen actors to um, set two communities against one another. And specifically in Phoenix, we saw 36 deaths, most of whom were black, three of whom were Indian. But, you know, if you just look at it on the face of the numbers, that's 10% of the national death toll coming from an area that's less than 30 square kilometers wide. In going through all of the intelligence documents that we managed to get our hands on in producing this book, we can see that this was a fear that was flagged by the intelligence cluster early on saying, we need to guard against racism because it emboldens these right-wing groups and it, it marshals people to their cause. You know, um, these uh, specifically Afrikaner groups who, who call for isolation of the race and call for isolation of their people, you know, a major selling point for them is the lawless state of the country. And in those eight days, the country was in a lawless state. Our democratic order was imperiled. It remains to be seen how successful that will be used to lobby people to their cause. And this is a future problem that receded now in these eight days. And it's probably something that was not conceived or thought out, but it will end up being a consequence because these right-wing groups themselves pose a security threat or have at a time posed a security threat. And the last thing that we need is to swell their ranks with more members who are discontented with the management of this country. Five agencies identified Zuma's daughter, Tutu Sile Zuma Zambudla, 
as a key figure uh, that instigated instability and violence. And she was using her social media, uh, Twitter more specifically, to instigate. Yes, well, I mean, they identified her, but I mean, she was operating in plain sight. Um, she she fanned the flames and deliberately propelled things, congratulating Mujahs as they moved across the country. When you look at how we produced this book, it's, it's impossible to, den- to deny the involvement of Jacob Zuma and by that virtue, Jacob Zuma's family. I mean, you, you have his daughter who, even before his imprisonment and all through his court travails leading up to this point, who has been a vocal proponent of opposition to the rule of law, a vocal proponent of her father's so-called innocence, and someone who, when when it mattered most, when the country was on tenterhooks, she was going on social media and essentially advocating for violence and advocating for looting. I mean, she she retweeted a video of uh, members of a cavalcade that had traveled to support her father before his imprisonment, shooting up a Cyril Ramaphosa election poster. And I mean, you know, the messaging behind that is clear. She since deleted that post, but then all through the unrest, she was very alive on her Twitter platform to hundreds of thousands of followers, um, you know, cheering these people on. And it wasn't only her, there was also videos posted of other of Zuma's children thanking people for their support. And, you know, at that stage when they issued thanks for people's support in, in this very glib manner, um, people were being attacked and killed. The Zuma family specifically and, and, and how we arrived at they seemed to be somewhat divorced from reality into... Uh, as as to what they exactly were condoning. Dudazila Sambudla Zuma was identified by te- intelligence agencies as, a, at the very least, a protagonist in this. But um, however many months we are on now, I think five months beyond that, um, there's been little consequence for her other than being um, disciplined by the ANC. And uh, that, to be plain, is, is quite a tepid response. Well, see, Jeff. Eight days in July saw more than 340 deaths, economic damage into the billions of brands, and ignited racial tensions, as you've explained. From your research, do you think that the instigators succeeded in their plans or did South Africa avoid the worst of it? I think they were very successful. If the motivation behind this was to cause maximum economic damage for political cause, absolutely objective achieved. You you know, you've got hundreds of thousands of jobs which are now decimated. You've got billions of rands which have been stripped away from an economy which is already limping because of the COVID-19 pandemic. What's distressing is that how quickly things went from bad to really, really bad. Um, In the space of a week, we had two provinces which were cut off from the rest of the country. And you you have to deploy our troops and the most sizable contingent of our troops on domestic soil. It becomes an international embarrassment. But I think a takeaway that that, that, that people must... um, acknowledge in the book and, and something we tried to highlight extensively is that you know, South Africa was on fertile ground for this, for this kind of action. We must be alive to the fact that those socioeconomic problems that underpinned this insurrection that allowed poor people to be um, whipped up and sent, sent on a rampage, they still exist today. There's, nothing has changed in these past couple of months. We haven't eradicated poverty. There's still an immense societal disparity between the haves and have nots. And the ground remains fertile. It now is up to our law enforcement agencies and our intelligence structures to do better and to move beyond the malaise of state capture, which has hollowed them out, and to provide the people of South Africa with the service and prevent this from happening again. Or at least understand that being forewarned is forearmed. And if they are to issue warnings like this, they cannot be ignored again. And we really need to take a long, hard look at the way this country is structured and, you know, the societal ills that beset us, because all of those, rather, are contributing factors to what set this whole strategy for destabilization in motion. That was journalist Jeff Wicks unpacking his co-authored book, Eight Days in July, Inside the Zuma Unrest That Sets South Africa Alight.